put in their sight. They ended up back in the cookie house. Mom, can I please have some chocolate chip cookies? His mother responded, I told you that you can't have any. Now sit down and be quiet. Now finally, they were approaching the checkout line. The little boy sensed that this may be his last chance. So just before they got to the line, he stood up on the seat of the cart and shouted in his loudest voice, in the name of Jesus, may I have, may I have some chocolate chip cookies. And everyone around started to snicker and some laughed. And due to the generosity of the other shoppers, the little boy and his mother unfortunately left the 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies. But we ought always to pray and not give up. Well, let's, let's turn to our, our text again today. It's found in Luke 18, 1 3. Luke 18, 1 through 8. Luke 18, 1 through 8. In verse 1, it says, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Saying, there was a city, there, there was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, no regard man, yet because his widow troubled me, I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Now, what is the... Uh, <clears throat> now, in this parable, we have, have a woman who is seeking justice from a judge. She had lost her husband by death and was poor, alone, and had no means to retrieve, to retrieve what was rightfully, rightfully hers. She sought help from one who could provide it to her. However, however, the judge was described as unjust. He appeared to pride himself on his ability to give arbitrary judgments or to withhold judgments um, at a whim because of the power afforded him. It seemed further that he had refused to make a judgment decision in her case and continued to postpone judgment because he had the power to do so. He says, I fear not God, nor regard men, but he still eventually grants the widow's request. Why? Not because he had compassion for the widow and her suffering. Not because he cared and wanted to relieve her suffering or relieve this suffering. He yields to the request so that he might be relieved of the inconvenience of her repeated asking. Now, this is contrasted with God's attitude toward us and with regards to prayer. In Romans 8.32, uh, Romans 8.32, it says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We know in John 3.16 and 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God not sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And, and further in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And in John 6, 37, it says, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And God cares for us, and he, he never turns away from our prayers and appeals. Even though our Heavenly Father may not seem to respond immediately to our, our prayers. He gave his son for us that we should be able to trust him that, when, that he would not withhold any good thing from us. Now, the purpose of this parable is stated in verse 1. It says, he spake a parable unto them 
uh, to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint, verse 1. Why is this important? Now, when I was a, a young, when I was young, I was an early teen or teenager, we knew that our father was the one who we needed to ask for permission to do, to do certain things. Usually, we may go to our mother first, but she would send us, always send us to our father. And often, um, you know, we want to go to some event, it could be a large event, small event, um, go to a county fair or go hang out with friends, et cetera. Especially on the, the, the one free night of the week, which is Saturday night. Um, and my dad's initial response was almost always no. Um, you know, then we would take this opportunity uh, to present our case to him. Um, we would explain our desire and our need in this case, and he would continue doing whatever he was doing, um, seemingly ignoring us. But after a while, usually it was five to 30 minutes, he would issue his final judgment. Uh, it, would, it would be either, did not tell you no, which meant, you know, you need to find something else to do, or yes, you can go, but I'm um, gonna give you certain instructions and, and restrictions. Now we always followed the, the final judgment. You know, we want to do um, what we want to do, but when he said no, we would find something else to do. When he said yes, we would rejoice, and then we would, we would go. We trusted in his decision and had faith in his wisdom and judgment. We know that even if we didn't like the decision, he had our best interest in mind. Now, why did we persist? We persisted because we knew that he was the one who could grant us our request. And because of our desire for what we asked, um, our desire for what we asked was great and we submitted to his authority. But so this, this gives us our, our question, why is persistent prayer important? Why is this the story of the widow important? I'll look, I'll look at three reasons I, I, think, I think so. And there, there are likely other reasons why it's important. The first one is that it transforms our lives. Well, sometimes as we would have petitioned our father, we would realize that what we desired was not as important or as desirable as we originally thought or felt. You know, other times our desire increased as we asked. Um, whichever the case, uh, we continued to ask because we, we understood that more, uh, <clears throat> as we continued to ask, we understood more about the thing that we asked for. As we pray continually, it places our trust not in ourselves, but in God. If we ask persistently, we'll be open to hearing and looking for an answer from God. Now, how does God, how does God speak to us? How does he speak to us? Um, money speaks to us through, through, through the Bible, right? His word. Uh, too, he speaks to us through, through other people. <clears throat> uh, he speaks to us through circumstances and providence. Now, how do you recognize, recognize God's voice when he speaks to us? Now, I think it's important then that we study, study God's word. Um, and uh, when we study God's word, what's important about it is that it helps us to recognize his voice in other settings. Now, after my, my mother died, my aunt, um, her sister sent me and my siblings a short bio that she had written about her life. And I remember my mother typing this out when I was a little kid and later uh, adding to it when I was a teenager. When I read it, I heard my mother's voice. I recognized her voice in the words that she had written, uh, the patterns, her speech patterns, the phrasing, the content. Now, God in his word, that the Bible gives us an opportunity to learn his voice. Then when he speaks to us, we're able to recognize, recognize it's him. Whatever form it comes in, we can recognize that it's his voice when we, when we hear it, when he speaks to us. Now, if we see in, in John 5.39, um, in John 5.39, Jesus says, search the scriptures, for them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, so we not only learn God's voice, uh, but we learn who God is. Mm -hmm. In Exodus 33, 18, uh, Moses asked God to show him his glory. 
Let's turn to uh, Exodus 34. And God, God answers his request in Exodus 34, 5 through 7. Exodus 34, 5 through 7. Verse 5 is that the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children. And to the third and to the fourth generation. So as when Moses asked God to show him his glory, God proclaims his character and claims, proclaims who he is. So not only do we recognize God's voice and learn about who God is, we are transformed as we study God's word and consistently lay our petitions before him. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it reads, but we all, with open face, beholding it in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So as we study God's word, we and see him, we are transformed as, as we study. The second reason a persistent prayer is important is that it brings us closer, closer to God. Now we are drawn closer to God as we as a result of studying his word and learning his voice. Now um Prayer brings us into a closer relationship with God and it establishes a dialogue between us and him. Uh, how do we get to know someone? And have you ever had uh, um, a person you saw and said, you know, I want to get to know him or her. And uh, what, what do you do? You introduce yourself. All right, what happens next after, after that? Some, something happens. All right, we, we start to spend time together. Okay. Um, uh, you talk, talk. Uh, you listen. You go out. You do activities together. You share things about yourself, and then they share. And you listen to things about their lives. The study by a University of Kansas professor it it was found that it took roughly 50 hours of time together to move from acquaintance to casual friend, and then around 80 to 100 hours of time spent together to move from casual friend to friend, then more than 200 hours. Uh, spent together to move from to, to get to become a close friend, and so when we pray and study God's word, it brings us it gives us time with God that draws us closer to, to Him. Now it's important that we um, spend that time with God because in Matthew seven twenty one and twenty three, we find a something that is kind of a warning to us uh, um, about lack of knowledge of God and. In Matthew, 20, in Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. You know, it says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So knowing God is a condition for our interest into heaven. If we don't know God, and he doesn't know us, then he doesn't know us. And, and so we need to, uh, uh, consistent and persistent prayer brings us closer to God and helps us to know God. Develop that friendship with God. Third um, thing that persistent prayer does, it develops and shows our faith. Now, we believe the one we ask can provide for what we ask. We have faith in the one we ask. The widow knew that the unjust judge could provide the justice that she sought, and that he was the only one that could provide it. So she persisted in asking. She had faith in his ability to provide justice. Well, the story of a philosopher who was a member of the court of Alexander the Great. He was a philosopher of outstanding ability, but he had very little money, he was poor. And so we asked Alexander, 
uh, for some financial help. And Alexander told him to go draw whatever you need from the imperial treasury. Now the man went to the imperial treasury and then he asked for 120, what's well, equal to $120,000. He was initially refused. The treasury was like, no, hold up, that's a lot of money. I need to verify that this amount is authorized. The treasurer went to ask Alexander and the ruler replied, pay the money at once. The philosopher has done me a singular honor. Uh, by the largeness of his request, he shows that he understands both my wealth and my generosity. Again, if we turn back to Romans 8.32, it says that he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? When we understand God's character, his mercy, his love, his generosity toward us, we will have faith and continue to pray. In James, uh, there is a... Uh, a brief mention of Elijah as an example of effectual fervent prayer. And it says in, in verse, in James 5, 17 and 18, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by a space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, if we look, kind of look at this event that's from verse 8 in, in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 18, if we go there, we find a more detail about oh, the second time he prayed where the heavens gave rain. And it reads in verse 41, Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. Verse 42, so Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go, he said, go again seven times. So he went and prayed, and each time the servant said, there's nothing there. He continued to pray, he continued to pray. In verse 44, it says, it came to pass on the seventh time they said, but behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. He said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot, get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. So Elijah here prayed fervently. He prayed until he received an answer or a sign of an answer from God. It's a sign. He believed the promise. God promised that it would rain he believed God's promise, and he prayed until he saw that, uh, until he saw it fulfilled. God desires that we pray. He promises to answer our prayer. Uh, we can claim his promises when we believe them and have faith in him. We demonstrate our faith by being like the widow and being persistent when we pray. George Mueller, a Christian evangelist, orphanage founder, and man of prayer, began to pray for five of, of his friends that he had from his youth. He wanted them to experience the life in Christ that he had the joy of living. So he decided to dedicate every day time to pray for them, whether he was sick, whether he was healthy. So I'm going to pray every day until they also can enjoy the life that I live now. 18 months passed before the first gave his heart to Christ. He praised God and continued to pray. Five years later, a second was converted. He praised God and continued to pray. Another six years passed, and the third was converted. He praised God and continued to pray. And another 40 years passed. George Mueller died. But a couple years after his death, both men gave their hearts. To Christ. George Mueller stated as he continued to pray, he said, my hope is in God. I pray on and look yet for the answer. They're not converted yet, but they will be. Now, I'm going to uh, close our message. And as I close, I'm, I'm going to make an appeal to you. Will you? And our appeal is um, is, is 
said, we'll, we'd, we'll, we make a, a pledge to be like the widow. Will we obey Christ's command to us to always pray and not faint? If so, let's stand and let's pray. Dear Lord, oh, you see those who, who stand um, to make a commitment to, to prayer. To prayer. Let us stay true to this commitment and daily spend time in prayer and, and, and putting our petitions before you. So we may, may know you, learn you, learn of you, and to be transformed as a result. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.